It was just before 7.30 p.m. on February 9th, 2004, when Maura Murray was last seen. Her car was found damaged, locked, and abandoned on Route 112 just outside of the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Her disappearance has haunted and frustrated family, friends, and a community of people searching for the truth. Since that night, there has never been a credible sighting. You're listening to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. How's it going, Lance? It's going going pretty well. How are you, Tim? I'm doing really well tonight. We wanted to do a quick intro to this episode because we got such a strong reaction from our last episode about psychics. Our listener base gave us uh, very uh, polarizing views on uh, not only psychics as uh, a legit enterprise, um, also psychics uh, applied to this case and whether or not we were um, kind of fooled by our psychic experience. Right, which I kind of take objection to that part because I don't think there's any way we were fooled here and it's not because we asked more questions than she did, which a lot of people pointed out and yeah, we did. But the point of this episode wasn't for the audience to decide if Lori Bruno was the real deal or not. The point of this episode was to see if any leads came of talking to a psychic. And when we were there, we were trying to find out if she felt anything with all the names we were asking her and all the details we were telling her about it. Right. And this was about a year and a half ago. And at that point, we had nothing on this online. And we had called her, I'm pretty sure we called her the night before or two nights before to make an appointment. So she would have really had to have searched to find out that this was what we were specifically t- were talking about. Because when we called her, we simply said we just had uh, something, a project we were working on, and we wanted some uh, some input from her. We didn't give her anything about a case. We didn't give her anything like that. And at that point, there was no website up or uh, anything about the documentary. That's a good point. Yeah, I, I forgot that there wasn't a website up at that point. Yeah, and Larry Bruno is, you know, 75 years old, actually. Uh, so, I mean, not that she's not on Facebook and Twitter. She is, but I don't really see her spend a lot of time on Google and that kind of thing. Yeah, possibly not. The, I mean, the other reason why I was open-minded to doing the psychic was uh, I knew that uh, the Murray family had gone to a psychic as well. So just they're trying to find an alternative way to uncover the truth here uh maybe something you know maybe if the psychic doesn't hit on every single thing and you walk away thinking that this is a absolutely mind-blowing experience maybe something that this person says rattles something loose in your head that you didn't know or you forgot was there you know maybe maybe with the intuition that a psychic has you realize that you've for- totally forgotten about some detail that that you uh you know through all of this you you didn't realize was there kind of in the back of your head and, you know, it's an alternative way to try to get those clues jarred loose from your head. And I figured, you know, maybe it wouldn't have even occurred to me if uh, if the Murray family didn't go to a psychic themselves. Because wow. that's how the conversation started when we were going, you know, talking about going to Lori. We had already known that the Murray family had gone to a psychic. So, hey, we might as well try it as well. Yeah. I mean, 11 years of traditional investigation hasn't solved the case. So we figured we'd try something a little less traditional. And we got a bunch of tweets and emails from our amazing listeners who loved the episode, actually, and said it was um, their favorite. And a lot of them said that they were startled by the fact that Lori Bruno, as well as Brian Ladd, both mentioned the name Ben as a name who was involved in Mora's disappearance. It's odd. It's a, you know, the very least, it's a coincidence. It's a very common name. So... I'm sure psychics just have a a stash of common names that they can, you know, kind of throw out there. You know, Ben's not, you know, it's not like calling somebody Jim. You know, it's Ben. It's kind of, it's right on that border of, uh, wow, she pulled out the name Ben. But Ben, that name has never been mentioned before. Could mean something or or it could, it, it, it probably doesn't. It probably doesn't, but I agree that it was kind of startling, and actually me and Lance both missed that in the editing process, the fact that two of the psychics said Ben. So thank you very much to the listeners who pointed it out to us. Um, It's pretty interesting, I think, and I feel like it's almost worth exploring these leads a little bit 
But in this experience and with this audience reaction and everything, I can absolutely see why law enforcement don't really want to get involved with psychics. And even if they believe in them, because if they say if they say something that sounds fishy, like say the name Ben, right? So we're spending a little bit of time investigating who's Ben. We could be using that time on something else. But if she's right and Brian was right, then, you know, that's good intel that we need to follow. So it kind of messes with your head a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it totally does. And the good thing about what, what's going on right now is that there's a listener base and this whole group of people who want to help out. So it's not like the police are, you know, thinking, well, we can't look at this name Ben because, uh, you know, we can't go knocking on every person's door whose name is Ben. But we have people out there who can go look at this right now in their own time, look into the case and see if this name Ben has ever popped up again. In that sense, I think it was a good thing. And also psychic Brian Ladd mentioned a Lake Tar being a possible location for Mora's body. Another great listener emailed us about Lake Tarleton in New Hampshire, which is actually about eight miles away from the crash site. And Brian Ladd is a little bit of a polarizing character himself. In addition to his website, there's actually a blog called Debunking Brian, and I found that kind of interesting. So, I mean, it is tef- definitely possible that Brian Ladd looked up the area and said, oh, you know, I want to sound accurate, but I don't want to be right on the money, and came up with the name Lake Tar as being short for Lake Tarleton. I have no idea. It's totally possible, though. Yeah, and, and his drawings, you know, they're drawings that uh, he, you know, supposedly had when he was dreaming. And, you know, they're they're scattered enough and they look schizophrenic enough to make you believe that. But who knows? Would love to get Brian on the show and have him talk about it. I, I know that he was really into the case a few years ago. I'm not sure uh, how involved he is now, but I know that that was one of his uh, his major ones that he had on his website. Well, I emailed him, and we got back a really interesting response. It was actually an auto-reply, and it it basically said that it is true that Brian Ladd actually suffers from mental illness, um, schizophrenia. So when he called himself the world's most accurate schizophrenic dreaming psychic, you know, he, he was actually... He was actually speaking literally? Yeah. And in his email, he said that, you know, there are some days, weeks, and even months that go by that, you know, this mental illness is really hard for him to overcome, and... He doesn't even want to talk to his family, let alone people who are reaching out for psychic readings. So we may not hear back from Brian at all, but he also said in that same email that there are other days where he wants to call everybody. So we may get a call at some point and have him on the show. But so that's all a good reason why we wanted to get a little bit more grounded for this episode. And this week we have on a professor of forensic psychology, Dr. Robert Eckstein from the University of New Hampshire. Yeah, and the um, as much as the uh, psychic ep- episode brought out uh, a lot of good responses, um, both critical and complimentary, we felt the episode where James Renner assured us and himself that Mora was a sociopath. The the feedback that we got from that was pretty overwhelming. So we felt we really owed it to the audience to bring on somebody not only familiar with the case but someone in the position like a forensic psychologist to, one, define the difference between psychopath and sociopath, but to apply it to the case and uh, give us his professional opinion about uh, whether or not he thinks Mora was one of those or both or none. Yeah, a pretty fascinating interview about psychology and forensic psychology and how it can be applied to this case. It was an enjoyable episode. I felt like some of the pressure was off. I felt like we were we were just kind of along for the ride on this episode. I don't know if you felt the same way. I agree. I think you and I are a little looser compared to other episodes where we're talking more directly about Mora and uh, you know the sad facts about this case. Yeah, and you know to hear a professor. You know, someone who someone who is well established and who's been around the world, by the way. This guy is uh, really, really cultured, and uh, to have him interested in the case in uh, in such a like clinical way, I just really felt we could sit back, listen to what he was saying. I was really fascinated by it. You know, the questions that that come up are, are very genuine. Uh, I really want to know what his what his whole take is and how he can apply everything that he's learned in that clinical sense to this case. And is that something that's going to be, 
sound enough to give a, a, a logical conclusion. So before we roll the interview, I just wanted to remind everyone to follow us on Twitter. The handle is at Maura Murray Doc, D-O-C. We also have a Facebook page. You can find us under the disappearance of Maura Murray or just type in Maura Murray. And we now have an Instagram page and that handle is Missing Maura Murray. And uh, there was also an article published about this case this week, and it's on medium.com. It's from a very talented writer named Chris Peak. So I invite everyone to look at that, and we urge everyone to actually share that on social media. We would love to get more eyeballs on this case and more earballs on this podcast. And there is a link to it in the show notes. The way the timeline is laid out really speaks to this particular generation because some of the timelines out there about uh, what happened in the in the days before and the hours before more went missing uh, is very uh, very broken down in you know in such a way where you, you just read the time and you see what happened but he, he puts a really nice narrative on it and I love it I, I think it's one of the most well-worded timelines out there about the disappearance we also wanted to remind everybody to call the voicemail line that we set up for your theories or actually we're going to expand it to really whatever you want your poetry your haikus, your thoughts, anything related to this case that you want to leave a message about, that's great. The only thing we don't want is actual leads. Those should be directed to the New Hampshire State Police. So please call 872-25-MORA, and that works out to 872-256-2872. 872-256-2872. We haven't gotten as many as we want, so please, if you're on the fence, give us a call. No one's going to answer. It's just going to go straight to voicemail. Okay, so without further ado, here is the interview with Dr. Robert Eckstein. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to the show, Dr. Robert Eckstein. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for emailing us and thanks for agreeing to come on the show. Sure. So what is your position? I'm a professor at the University of New Hampshire. I teach in the psychology department and in the justice studies program. I teach the forensic psychology undergraduate course at the university. So what is forensic psychology for people who don't know? Forensic psychology is, to give it kind of a a pretty broad definition, it's the interaction between psychology and law um, with a little bit more of a specific focus on the interaction between psychology and the criminal justice system. So forensic psychology looks at ways that the science of psychology can inform um, criminal justice decisions or criminal justice investigations. And this is something that is um, pretty uh, readily used in uh, court cases? Yeah. I mean, some common things that people think about when they think about forensic psychology are um, providing evidence at uh, an insanity trial or something like that, or a competency to stand trial evaluation or um, a civil commitment case. And then I think what most people think about when they think about forensic psychology, although it's not used as widely as I think the media sometimes makes it out to be, would be criminal profiling or you know trying to solve a crime from a, a psychological vantage point. Have you ever done that with the law by any chance? No. And that's, you know, I, I wanted to make that clear. Just to give you a little bit of my background, my, uh, my BA is in forensic psychology, and I was really interested in forensic psychology when I was younger. My doctorate degree is actually in clinical psychology. And um, when I was in graduate school, I did a lot of forensic work. I, I spent a year working in the mental health unit of a maximum security prison outside of Baltimore. And then I worked at a community mental health center for a little over a year where I did some outpatient forensic evaluations. But those were evaluations that were more for the courts as opposed to, you know, working with the police department from an investigative angle. You know, some of my experiences in graduate school led me a little bit away from um, being a forensic psychologist. And I'm, I'm more of just a general clinician. But because of my interest in forensic psych, and because right around the time I got to UNH happened to be the time when I think more students were getting interested in the topic or at least asking about it. So, and we didn't have any forensic psychologists on staff, but because of my clinical background and because of my, my previous work doing forensic, um, doing some forensic work, I kind of fell into teaching the forensic psychology class. And I'm not, a, I, I want to make it clear, I'm not a practicing forensic psychologist. 
a more of a general clinician. But because I teach the class, I'm always um, staying on top of things, and uh, I'm really sort of fascinated by uh, how forensic psychology can be used in, in various cases. When did you start your time at UNH? Actually in 2003, so a year before. It was 2004 that the disappearance occurred, right? Yep. I remember it happening. Uh, at the time, one of my close friends was um, was teaching at UMass, and as soon as my wife and I moved up here, we spent a lot of time. You know, I think when you move to New England, you move you go up to the White Mountains to you know check it out, and um, we spent a lot of time out there. So I think anytime there's a high profile case and you feel some type of a connection to it, you're always going to be a little bit more interested in it. So I do remember when it happened, and then I, to be honest, I forgot about it for a long period of time, and then I think like a lot of people. I kind of got I got brought back in, into it. I think after the disappear uh, disappeared episode, I think is like what a lot of people cite as what got them interested in this. And then, like I think everybody else, I just sort of went down the rabbit hole that lots of people go down and really wanted to get more information about the case. So it's really only been the last I would say maybe like year and a half or so that I've been kind of back, you know, doing the same things everybody else does, checking all the Reddit's and the web sleuths and uh, James Renner's blog and. I'm getting more into it. And how did you hear about this podcast? I teach this forensic class. So I'm always, I do a lot of case studies with my students. And I'm always looking for cases that are maybe a little bit under the radar that maybe they haven't heard of. Because of that, I I do listen. I still read a lot of true crime books. And I do listen to true crime podcasts. And it was the Generation Y podcast mentioned this was happening. You know, they mentioned you guys. I don't know if you even know that. Yeah. But they, yeah, yeah they do. mentioned you. And I, I don't even remember what episode they were doing, but it was a case that I was interested in. So I was listening to that. And they mentioned you guys. And I was like, oh, that's an entire podcast to one case. And that's what got me into checking out your podcast. Very cool. No, it was uh, the Heyman Lee case that. Uh, the oh, episode... that, oh, that makes sense that I would listen. That's the one that everybody's interested in. It makes sense that I would listen to that. Yeah. We love those guys. I've been a fan of that show for a long time as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I was actually, you know, I was living in Baltimore when that um, murder occurred. So, um, yeah, the, the I was just talking to my wife about this recently. I grew up about 20 minutes from where the Long Island serial killer <laughs> was doing his thing. <laughs> Um, and then I, uh, when I lived in Baltimore, that, that murder occurred. And, um, a little after I moved to New England, the Maura Murray, um, disappearance happened. So I would say three of the more high profile true crime cases that people are, um, really curious about were pretty close to, I guess a lot of people could say that because unfortunately there are so many cases, but, um, yeah, I, I tend to follow around these high profile cases. So there's a pattern. <laughs> yeah, I, I should be careful about that. <laughs> So actually, just before we get into the Morris stuff, just out of curiosity, what do you think about the Hey Min Lee case? And uh, if you don't know what that is, that's the serial podcast, uh, the one that they talked about, um, the case uh, against Adnan. Yeah, I I think I feel that way the same way I feel about this one, which is I don't know. You know, there's just um, the, I, I was going to refer to this later. One of you guys during one of your episodes talked about the Oakham's Razor approach and how for this one, there, they none of them work. Mm. You know, like every the, every road you go down, there's something that gets in the way of that theory. So then you move to another one, and then there's something that gets in the way of that theory. And I feel like the Adnan case is is pretty similar. You know, once I was going down one road, um, I, I think like most people, um, I, I do believe that um, Jay was more involved, but I don't think that's a, a groundbreaking take. You know, on that case. I definitely think he was more involved, and I think there were probably some, um, you know, probably some other criminal elements at play there, maybe in terms of the drug trade or something like that, that unfortunately is prominent in that part of Baltimore. It might be the reason why so many people are keeping quiet about things. Do you think Adnan is a psychopath? Um, based on the limited, you know, information, um, I would I would say no. I'm interested in the assignment that you've created for your students based on this case. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and it's funny because I'm not going to let them know that I'm on here because I don't want to give away any answers or anything before we do it. So I'm going to have them listen to this later in the semester after I do it. What I'm going to have them do, and um, and and you guys have probably, um, maybe you haven't heard this term before, but I think for you guys and everybody else that's listening, you're aware of the concept even if you haven't heard the term. But um, something that is done sometimes in these sorts of cases are what are called psychological autopsies. So have you guys heard that term before? I have not. 
traditionally, I mean, they date back to the 1960s or so, but um, psychological autopsies are done when there's some suspicious nature surrounding a death. So when it's difficult to determine if it's a suicide or a homicide or an accidental death. Uh, traditionally, they've been done in criminal cases when there's some um, discrepancy over whether or not it was a homicide or a suicide. Um, the military has done them before. Um, in, there are these really unfortunate cases where people do commit suicide, like in, in battle, and then um, trying to determine if it was suicide or friendly fire or, or uh, you know, a more traditional um, military death. And they're done like insurance and claims, too, if people are claiming an accident but it was really a suicide. And it's basically... Um, what everybody does for this case, what you guys are doing and what James Renner is doing, we, we, nobody really calls it that, but it's basically a psychological autopsy, which is trying to get into the head of the person, in this case, Mora, um, especially in like the maybe three to six weeks before the incident occurred. So most of the research on psychological autopsies are on people who have died, you know, trying to determine a suicide versus a homicide etc. But there is some interesting literature on doing psychological autopsies um, where then the name doesn't really apply because we don't actually know if the person's dead, but that's usually still what it's called, uh, on missing persons cases and trying to get into the mind of the person before they went missing with the idea that if you kind of understand their mindset prior to their disappearance, you have a little bit of a better idea of maybe what they were up to and um, you know what their uh, intentions were. Um, and I think that's what we all do with this case. Um, you know, looking at where she booked rooms and what the significance of that might be and who she may have been with and what might have happened at that party. That's basically a psychological autopsy. So for my, that's for my students, I'm going to, I'm going to give them information that looks really objective. I'm going to try to find the most kind of, um, unquestionable objective information, things that we definitely know have happened with Mora. And these people, my students don't know anything about this case is what I'm assuming. And I want to see what they come up with in terms of the most likely outcome without all the noise and distractions of questionable evidence. And it's, it's actually quite a bit like criminal profiling where you look at previous cases. And then based on previous cases, you look at what are called either risk factors or predictor variables. So what the research will tell you is that people who commit suicide there are certain behaviors that are commonly seen prior to the suicide. Um, people who are homicide victims, there are things that are commonly seen like in their lives prior to a homicide occurring. Um, and there's less evidence on, on missing persons, but there are certain predictor variables of people who may have intentionally chosen to go missing. So I'm going to have them um, try to figure out what the most likely outcome in this case is without them having any interference from people like me or your podcast or James, you know, James Renner's blog, um, just trying to look at the evidence that we know is present. That's great. Um, but what if they've heard of the podcast already? What if they're yeah, a, a huge yeah, fans? I mean, is, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you never know. I mean, you guys are taking off. It's, it's a possibility. <laughs> Things like that have happened before, and it, it sounds sort of silly, but I'm like, if you do know this case, just try to keep quiet about it, <laughs> you know? Um, so I the... Uh, yeah, I use serial quite a bit in my because it last time I taught forensic psych was first semester last year, so it was when serial was on, um, and we ended up talking about serial in class pretty much every week. So, what do you expect the students to come up with um, as far as conclusions? I'm I'm not sure. I mean, one of the you know it's interesting because in some ways my students are not experts on this stuff; they're undergrad you know forensic psychology students. Um, on the other hand, I'm sort of hoping that they're, um, what they come to, there'll be sort of a purity to what they come to because they are looking at it with a, um, a set of really fresh eyes. Uh, so I'm going to have them do a couple of readings about the predictor variables of different outcomes. So what's, you know, what are predictors of outcome A or outcome B? Um, and I'm not sure. You know, well, I, I, you know, we'll probably get into this. I don't know what happened in this case, and I'm, I'm definitely open to multiple theories, but... The stuff that I've been looking at, I mean, I, I have, I lean one way more so than, than another way with this case. Um, and I, I'm going to try very hard to not let them know what my opinion is before they come to it. Now, do you think uh, with your students being around the same age as Mora, you know, in college, do you think that they're going to use that as um, maybe even like a subconscious like uh, influence? Yeah, they, I think we all do that. 
Um, right. I think it, it's I think it's one of the reasons this case you know appeals to people. Um, I know you guys are both from New England, and I've lived in New England for a while. There's um, I think there's like this additional empathy piece when it's somebody that we can relate to a little bit. And you know, I teach at UNH like demographically and geographically. UNH and UMass are really similar to one another. And, uh, I, you know, at the risk of stereotyping, Mora, in all those pictures you see of her, she looks like, like, 75% of my students, you know, like, they're, it's, so I, and I think they probably will do a little, little bit of that. Um, they also might be able to relate a little bit, maybe more so than I would, or, or you guys would, to maybe some of the stress that she was under, or, um, you know, they might see some things uh, of just sort of the stress of being a young woman in college, um, especially with some of the family dynamics that we know were present there. You know, they might see some things because they're able to put themselves in the position of the missing person in this case. Very exciting. I can't wait to hear what uh, what they say. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll keep in touch with you guys and let you know. Yeah, please. Now, if you don't mind, there are specific moments that happened before Mora went missing. And I just wanted to run them by you and maybe yep. get your take on uh, on a few of these. And you know, we'll we'll end up talking about them. Uh, that will probably lead to something else, as this case typically does. Yeah. Um, but the first thing that I want to um, talk about in relation to the days before she went missing is the credit card fraud. Yeah. And there's this. Uh, I don't know if you um, were listening when we had the picture of her when she. Right. The picture was yeah. taken of her outside of the dorm when she. Yeah was uh, busted for credit card fraud. Yeah. And we were just struck by the difference yeah. between that Mora and the picture that you see online, um, right. you know, on, on, uh, on all the, on the blogs and on the, on the websites where, you know, she's, uh, she's got the, the smile and the dimples yep. and, um, you know, you really can't even see that. It did, was there anything in that picture that you look at and you, and you think to yourself, I can see something in those eyes that, that I recognize? Yeah, I, I think there's something also about the quality of the picture that is makes it especially disturbing. Um, and I'm not sure if it's, if it's a photocopy of the picture. There's something very um, – I know you were guys were kind of creeped out by that picture. And I totally agree. I think there is something like disconcerting about it. But I see it more as um, – I think she looks scared. She looks in that picture like somebody who's been through a lot. And is uh, maybe a little bit scared about, you know, what's what's just happened to her. It also, you know, I think she, in every other picture, she does look so um, kind of full of life and, and really smiling. And um, it's, it, it, I think when I see that picture, it's like somebody who's like finally like letting their guard down a little bit. Um, and that, that might be a little bit more what that you know what she looked like in the week or so before her disappearance she might have looked more like she did in that picture than in some of the pictures that um we always see on the missing posters yeah that's one of the thing the thoughts i have um especially when we talk about butch atwood having yeah. having uh, seen her and then when the police showed him a picture of her he said oh that's not the person i saw it, and if you think of you know after she gets charged for the the credit card fraud that's a high stress situation that she's in where she's probably pretty overwhelmed by what's happening. And when he, you know, when he um, found her after the accident, she's going to be in a very similar position. You know, she's going to be very, I would imagine she'd be um, incredibly stressed out about what was happening to her in that moment. So she's, she's much more likely to look like that, especially after the accident, um, than in, in all the pictures that we see of her. As far as leading up to her leaving her dorm, is there anything that stands out there as far as um, returning the lab coat to uh, to a fellow student or uh, packing up her things? Yeah, I think what's what's tough about that, and this is where the same way um, I think you know when I'm looking at this more as just like a true crime buff or somebody who has some concern for a missing person, and I think the thing that you guys have struggled with, you can read almost everything. Um, more than one way. And unfortunately, I mean, I, I do have some, I think, some interesting things to share with you guys. But as far as that goes, we do know that it's a relatively common occurrence for people who um, commit suicide to return things prior to their suicide to, you know, um, maybe it, it, in a small way, kind of like correct things or make small amends, those sorts of things. Um, the problem is, I, I think that behavior 
might be just as likely, you know, if 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 you want to use uh, James Renner's theory about you know intentionally disappearing, I think that's going to be just as likely for somebody who um, knows that they're not going to be back for a long time. I actually think that's um, kind of an important behavior, but unfortunately for us, the two roads that it kind of pushes us down as possibilities are like the two things that are you know commonly argued about this case. So it doesn't provide too much clarity. On the episode where we first had James Renner. Um, on to, to talk about this case. He said that he believes Maura Murray is a sociopath. That comment got a lot of flack online and uh, started a lot of discussion. And then we sort of tried to defend him on the maybe one of the next episodes saying that he could be right and plus it was just his opinion. And really we sort of minimized what he was saying about her. And then you, yep. you emailed us and said that we were a little bit wrong, or me, me actually, specifically. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so I am very curious in what you have to say about this. The way that I'll maybe take you through this is I'll talk a little bit about um, James's theory as far as that goes. And then maybe I'll provide, it might take a little while to get there, but I'll provide kind of an alternative theory. And then I will come back around to the possibility that maybe James is right. So, you know, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll go in a little bit of a circle around this. My hunch, though, is that it's unlikely that she's um, a psychopath. And just in terms of the terminology, it's, it's a little bit of a tricky term. Um, the original term that was used, you know, over 100 years ago was psychopath. And um, the, the, the original definition for psychopath was um, malice without madness, which I, I really kind of like that. The idea was that, you know, the majority of people that are, especially then, that were overtly violent and really dangerous and predatory, they were, they were really actively mentally ill. You know, um, what we would now probably think of as like psychotic, back then it was more, you know, they thought it was due to, you know, things that might be more supernatural in nature. But there seemed to be this small group of people who were really cunning and manipulative and predatory, but they seemed to be of a sane mind when they were that way. And really ever since then, that is more or less like how we've thought about um, psychopaths or sociopaths, people who um, behave in these ways, but it's not because they're, you know, have a clinical mental disorder um, or, you know, a chemical imbalance. It's, it's sort of more wired into their personality. The term psychopath was used for like the first half of last century, there was this brief period of time where we moved over to using the term sociopath, and there's a kind of a boring history of why that happened. But now, psychologists really only use the term psychopath. So um, in any of the, like, the psychological, like the empirical literature, you're only going to use the see the word psychopath used. So that's the term that, that I'll probably use. Just to clarify here, sociopath and psychopath, they mean pretty much the same thing? Yeah, there was um, something called like the social the social learning movement that happened in like the 1950s and the 1960s, where psychologists were looking really heavily, really for the first time, at the role that social environment can play on people and on personality. And there was a shift during that time period to really look at sociological, um, you know, trends. And at that point, sociopath became a little bit more of an in vogue term to use. And then the modern, you know, when when the when the definition kind of shifted back in the early 1990s, the field decided to go with psychopath or psychopathy. Uh, and that's, but when we use it just kind of to throw the term around, yeah, we can use them interchangeably. That was really informative. We've had a lot of uh, backlash on uh, people telling us, you know, what their thought is. And it's good to get somebody who has, you know, a degree in this to say, here's, here's the deal. Yeah. And I, I have seen people try to like, make these small distinctions between the two, but I, I've never really seen that in like the academic literature. I've seen that more in just like, um, you know, like pop psychology books and things like that. I'm going to kind of um, be critical of you guys just for a second. And then, you know, Please. for the most part, I've, I've loved the show and, you know, I'll, I'll say a lot of more nice things as we go on. And we'll just but, cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> when you guys were, um, when you guys were talking about Mora and talking about a uh, psychopath on, that I think was when I emailed you, you said that there was this lack of empathy with her and the lack of empathy is sort of what you need in order to diagnose somebody with psychopathy. And I think one of you said like, it's, you know, that's all you need. And I, I, I sort of screamed at the computer for a second because um, there are actually 20 symptoms that load onto the, like the psychopathy construct to diagnose with some, uh, somebody as a psychopath. There are actually 20 variables that are looked at. So a lack of empathy is one of only 20. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, and the 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 state of the art for diagnosing a psychopath is a psychological test called the PCLR, which is the Psychopathy Checklist Revised. I've actually um, taken it. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, interesting. I'm not a so, psychopath, everybody. Yeah, good. That's good to know. The PCLR up for debate. Up for debate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The PCLR is, it's the work of Robert Hare, who's a, 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 a Canadian um, forensic psychologist. There are, um, and just to give you like a little information, there, there are 20 criteria for it or 20 symptoms. Um, it's a very rare diagnosis. It's a, it's a difficult, you know, threshold to cross. Uh, to give you an example of that, the majority of prisoners in the United States are not psychopaths. It's, it's, a, it's, it's tough to be to really get that diagnosis. Now, in fairness to you guys, um, and, and, and just to create a caveat for that, the PCLR was designed for inmates. So it was standardized at forensic hospitals and at prisons. So it does, um, it might not be picking up some of the qualities of a non-criminal psychopath. So, and I, what you guys mentioned this, and you were right about this. There are psychopaths in the business world. There are psychopaths sometimes in our families. Um, there are psychopaths among us that might not score exceedingly high on the PCLR because it is intended for more of a forensic um, crowd. That being said, I I don't see evidence of of more of being a psychopath, and I'll I'll take you through some of the reasons why. The first is I'm not sure on the stuff that I've seen that she even necessarily um, lacks empathy. She seems capable of building relationships with people. She seemed pretty well liked by the people that she knew. I do, one of the things that struck me about the disappeared episode was her friends prior to getting to UMass really spoke highly of her. Um, normally, when people are psychopaths as, as adults, there's evidence of a real callousness and coldness um, as part of their personality during their childhood and adolescence. Um, the, there's more increasing evidence that psychopathy is actually a physiological condition and that there's impairment in the frontal lobe of the brain. So if somebody has this, they're likely to at least show some of the signs of it early. Um, so, I mean, I again, I don't want to read too much into uh, this young woman, but she never really struck me as somebody who didn't care about other people or who couldn't um, couldn't build relationships. Some of the other really important symptoms that are part of a, a psychopathic personality pattern that I don't think she has is um, being really glib or superficially charming. So being like really facile verbally, having a grandiose sense of self worth. She didn't. I, I don't. I never heard evidence of her being really egocentric or or. Um, narcissistic. Um, this is an interesting one, pathological lying. I know there are some lies that she told right before she disappeared, but the type of pathological lying that you see among psychopaths is lying that doesn't even really serve a purpose. So psychopaths will often boast about things that aren't true or lie as a way to impress people. Um, and I, I don't think there's evidence of that. Early behavioral problems, she seemed, at least unless the family did a good job of hiding it, she seemed like a good kid um, when she was younger. And then callousness, so being really cold um, towards other people in childhood and adulthood. Um, the other thing that I think is really key about her not being a psychopath, um, and I will present a, an alternative to this a little bit later, but this is what I'm about to say is what I, I believe a little bit more strongly, is one of the more fascinating things about psychopaths is they show much, much lower levels of stress and anxiety. Psychopaths are generally unfazed by things that really kind of stress out other people. And um, it just seemed like the breakdown that she had at work that night, she seemed very overwhelmed by what was ever was happening. I know one of the gentlemen you interviewed spoke to her supervisor that night, and she felt like that was a very genuine um, breakdown that she had. The way that she, I, you know, sort of left her life behind, I think to me is evidence of somebody who was overwhelmed and, and was somewhat stressed. I see somebody who probably was struggling with, I, I don't know if it was at a diagnosable level, but struggling with a lot of stress and anxiety. Um, and that's not something that you commonly see um, in people who are these like very cold, calculating psychopaths, um, which I, I guess brings me to what I would say is a more likely clinical picture of Mora. Is there a label for what is likely a more clinical? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a little... I, I don't know if I'd give it a perfect label, but I, you know, I look a little bit at her, 
her background and some of the things that we do know about her. Um, it seems like she was highly driven. It seems like she was um, an overachiever um, or at least somebody who worked very, very hard, um, especially when she was, you know, first getting to school. Um, we see evidence of significant pressure from her family, uh, an older sister who got into West Point, and then it sounds like probably expectations on her around getting into West Point. Um, something that I see a lot when I've worked at college counseling centers is the, the pressure that's often on first generation college students around like being, you know, kind of being the standard bearer for your family a little bit and the pressure that that often causes. I, I This is where I might be speculating a little bit, but I think um, people who know the case much better than I do, like James Renner, they do talk about the pressure that Fred often put on her. So you've got that kind of um, pressure. And what's interesting is when you talk about like highly driven um, kind of success oriented people who come from these high pressure families where there are a lot of expectations, actually a really common hobby among people who fit that personality type is running. So it's this interesting combination of the family picture and then, and then the running. So the diagnostically, I know there's been some mention and I hope it's okay that I'm talking about this. I, I think people have mentioned this elsewhere that she had symptoms of bulimia, which you do sometimes see with competitive runners. But bulimia is a very common diagnosis among, you know, that personality type that I talked about who comes from that type of family system. We know, I, I would speculate there's at least some anxiety and, and stress that probably surrounded trying to um, achieve these things. And then the other thing that I think is, is sometimes glossed over a little bit is, I mean, I think she definitely had an alcohol abuse problem. The amount of drinking that kind of consistently comes up in the stories that we hear, um, the fact that she had one alcohol, potentially one alcohol-related accident the night of the party, and then just, you know, a few days later has the alcohol when she's driving away on the night that she disappeared. There's, you know, it sounds like there's some self-medicating going on there. And people, young women that self-medicate in these types of situations, I think they're usually medicating around stress and anxiety. Um, and the other thing, and this one's interesting because this is a predictor of, of suicide, is um, some people have speculated that she might have been manic or, you know, may have been in a manic episode or something like that. There's something called hypomania that people don't know quite as much about, which is, um, it's similar to bipolar disorder, but the episodes aren't as severe. Um, people that are hypomanic have kind of Again, it, it's common among personality types of people that are really driven, people that are really success oriented, um, people that are perfectionistic. And some of the symptoms are like are things like impulsivity, which the what she the trouble that she got into at West Point and the credit card fraud, for a smart person to do those things, that sounds like very impulsive behavior. The increased drinking, you know, as as time was going on. And then again, this is might be a little bit uncomfortable to talk about, but James Renner has acknowledged some really promiscuous behavior um, in the year or so, maybe, be, you know, a after she got to UMass. Um, so the impulsivity, the increased drinking, and the promiscuity, those are symptoms of, of hypomania. So I know I'm naming a lot of things, but um, I, I think a more clear picture of her is a, is a woman who felt a tremendous amount of pressure, partially because of the drinking, uh, there's probably an increased level of anxiety and, um, and maybe some, maybe some hypomania in, in like the time prior to her, um, leaving UMass. So do you think all of that leads to a uh, form of self, uh, destructive behavior? Because, um, you know, being driven and having her family, uh, encourage the, uh, that driven behavior and her being a yeah. runner. Um, you know, we, we hear that she was driven, but then we hear that she, is uh, asked to leave West Point for stealing makeup. And then we yeah. hear that she's, you know, stealing credit card numbers to eat. And she didn't really yeah. need to do that. Um, no. It just yeah. seems like uh, at some point she realizes, I don't know, I'm just, and, and I'm not um, an expert in this, but if things start to get kind of out of her control, she decides to self-destruct and and, uh, yeah. and make sure that uh, that she has full control, even if it's, even if it's like her getting kicked out. I, I agree. I mean, I, I think the, um, I think, I think you're absolutely right about that. She was definitely becoming self-destructive that with the, 
um, with the drinking, with like the, the relatively petty crime, but, you know, um, based on where she was, you know, petty crime that could have gotten her into quite a bit of trouble. In terms of looking at going back to the psychological autopsy piece and looking at the increased drinking, um, probably, you know, maybe some sort of an anxiety disorder and eating disorder. And then the things that you're talking about, she strikes me, you know, in a vacuum, you know, if we're able to remove some of the other, you know, albeit interesting and maybe important things about the case, she strikes me more as somebody who was looking either to harm herself or to take like a little bit of a break. You know, um, the, the amount of planning she did to me seems sort of temporary and a little sloppy and a little bit more, I think, aligned with somebody who, exactly as you said, who is like overwhelmed by the amount of pressure that she's experiencing and just kind of wanting to get away from it all. So um, there are people who can speak at much greater length and expertise about how difficult it would be to run into the woods. I know uh, James Renner has made some pretty convincing uh, points about how it wouldn't be that easy for her just to kind of disappear into the landscape up there. Um, but if if she's dealing with all of this stress and all of this anxiety um, and this need to kind of please others and feeling that she's failing, if she got into that car accident, to me, that that probably really would have been the beginning of the end of her just wanting to get away. What do you mean? What would she have done then? I, I mean, just um, wandered off and, you know, um, I... I I, I think the most likely outcome, and it, in some ways I'm kind of bothered by this because it's like the, it's sort of the saddest outcome maybe and, and the maybe the least interesting outcome from a, just like a, an objective true crime standpoint, but I think she probably wandered into the, into the woods. Hmm. And, you know, um, like I said, people know more about that, um, uh, how likely that is. And like I said, James Renner has done a nice job of, you know, kind of convincing me it's not that easy you know, where she, and I, I kind of agree, but maybe she just took off on foot and, and found a place to, um, even if it wasn't intentionally just to hide out for a little while, especially if she thought that she was going to be getting into trouble again, um, especially if she had been drinking, especially if she might have had some head trauma because of the car accident. I, unfortunately, I, I think she probably um, perished in the woods. That was her father's first reaction when he was right. told about it. Um, yeah. But later he said that he, she was, uh, she was taken by somebody up yeah. there. Um, right, right. Which, and that, that, you know, I think for the same reason other people like the find that unlikely is the same reason I find that unlikely. Just it, it would have to be such a small window and such an opportunistic offender to be able to pull something like that off. Um, I think she was either leaving UMass to hurt herself or to take a little bit of a trip and to take a little bit of a break from what was becoming um, a stressful life. And maybe it was supposed to be short term, but then once the accident happened, um, yeah, I will, I will say this. I want to, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm going against James Renner's theory and, and he's the one who's provided me with a lot of information about this case. So I'll make a little bit of a, a, a quick, um, argument in favor of the psychopathy piece, even though I don't really, I don't really believe it. Some of the symptoms that I just mentioned, and this makes clinical diagnoses difficult. Some of the symptoms that I just mentioned that are related to hypomania or anxiety or perfectionism, also are symptoms of psychopathy. So on the um, psychopathy checklist is impulsivity, and she definitely was impulsive in the weeks before her disappearance. Promiscuity is on the PCLR, and there is some evidence of that, and conning and manipulation. I don't read what she did in those last couple of weeks as examples of conning and manipulation, but I know, you know, it sounds like James Renner does, and it sounds like there are some people on the message boards who make some, you know, con convincing arguments that that might be the case. There is a possibility that this was an incredibly well-orchestrated plan, that maybe she, the, the breakdown at work was fake. Um, one of the people that I'm fascinated by with in this case that I actually think would provide some interesting information, and I think he's been not really willing to talk, is the officer who pulled her over the night of the party where she got into the first car accident. Because I would love to know how she got out of that. Well, um, yeah, I mean, James Renner asked him that question yeah. and he was hung up on. Yeah, it's really fascinating because if James's theory is right, you might have a young woman who, you know, going back to that, that really, you know, kind of interesting thing you guys did early with the, was it the scorpion and the frog? Was it that one? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she might be a young woman who can just could have the ability to turn that on 
and could talk her way out of anything if given the right situation. And she might have conned him in that minute. She also, though, might have just been like broken down and he might have just felt bad for her. But if, you know, if she lied to her supervisor the night of that interview as a way to kind of set up this ruse that something was happening in her family, if she really manipulated her way out of that DUI, if she intentionally left, left a deceptive trail about, you know, getting directions for one place when actually driving in a little bit of a different direction, if she did con her dad out of that $4,000, you can look at some of the things that she may have done prior to leaving and say that's perfect evidence of conning and manipulation. And that actually is a symptom of psychopathy and maybe Renner is onto something with that. I see that behavior as much more kind of haphazard and sloppy and indicative of stress and anxiety and not psychopathy, which leads me to in the other direction. Um, and I think for me, what it comes down to is just, you guys did that episode where you talked about what's the percentage of this and the percentage of that. Just with law of averages, if we're going to make the diagnosis predictive of her plan, you know, suicide versus intentionally missing, um, you know, anxiety and stress and a combination of bulimia, anxiety, stress, hypomania in young women is significantly more common than psychopathy. You know, like her having a breakdown based on how difficult her life was getting and there's some presence of, some presence of mental health symptoms. Law of averages, I just think that's a more likely diagnosis. And so it makes me lean in that direction. Based on what you know about psychopathy and, you know, the, it's, I know it's about 1% to 2% of the public. Well, yeah. What do you think the odds are that she was abducted by some opportunistic person who, and and if this you know person did kill her, maybe he's killed before. It would be it would be tough to just imagine this was the per- person's oh, fir- yeah. first crime and get away with it so perfectly. So you'd have to probably assume that they have done this at least once before. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what are the odds of that? That, I mean, that's, it's also, I think it's very unlikely. And you bring up a really good point. It's unlikely because of the opportunistic angle of it. And I, for me, this is, I think, why this cat, this case is so fascinating that whatever it was, and it's debated whether it was seven minutes or 10 minutes, those few minutes, you know, after, um, and Butch was his name, right? After Butch left yeah. and before the cops came, like, to me, this is what first drove me to this mystery. It was like, it's rare in a missing person's case that you can narrow it down to such a small window when we lost them, you know, when they, when they did disappear. And um, the likelihood of somebody coming by at that moment who, A, was that opportunistic, and then, B, it's hard this day and age to get away with that type of a, that type of a crime, I think is very unlikely. And I entirely agree that if – she was kidnapped and, and you know, murdered in some kind of horrible, you know, instance like that. It, it's almost unheard of for somebody to do that once and never do it again. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's whoever, had, if, if that happened, um, they either have done this, you know, prior to Mora or after Mora. I know there have been some high profile cases in New Hampshire in that area in the last few years. Um, and those folks, I think, have all been ruled out. Um, I know there's, I think there's somebody who's still awaiting trial for that kidnapping up in the Conway area. I, you know, he's been ruled out as a suspect. Um, you know, there are these, you know, there are cases of serial killers, serial killers generally stay in, in kind of a designated area and they don't roam too much, but there are exceptions to that. There's the, uh, I forget his last name. His first name is Israel. Do you guys know the case I'm talking about from a couple of years ago? Yeah, the one in Alaska. Yeah. I mean, that guy's, wow, you know, fascinating because he committed homicides in so many different parts of the country. And it was one of the reasons he was difficult to track down. So, you know, there is a possibility of somebody who's not on the New Hampshire rate, you know, the, 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 the radar of the police up here because they've since moved on. But I think all of that is really unlikely. What do you think the odds are that she actually hit Patrit Vassy, the UMass student? Could this could that have been the perfect catalyst for her to want to get away, for her to just stress out so much that she needed to either get away or maybe think about killing herself? Yeah, I mean, it seems like if that happened, if she was involved, it definitely seems like, I mean, some the credit card fraud happened prior to then. The anything that happened at West Point happened prior to then, but that if that happened, it seems like that's the beginning of the chain of events. 
um, the, the fear of getting in trouble, maybe the fear of letting down her, her family. Um, maybe she, who knows, maybe she even told her family and the way they responded was really kind of heartbreaking for her. Uh, yeah, that, I, I, I have no idea. There are people who can, I think, speak uh, in terms of like those sorts of details about the case, the likelihood that she was involved in that. But yeah, that would, that would be a massive stressor and, 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 and just sort of would add to this list of stressful things that she underwent in the time before she left. And not to, uh, you know, not to throw a monkey wrench into everything that you've just given us. Yeah. Do you, do you think that anybody else would have known about her state of mind like this? You have her particular behavior and, you know, she's got the book in her car, the, uh, not without peril. Yeah. Um, and so we have, we have her behavior and then we have the behavior of her family and her friends at UMass who just don't talk about things yeah. about more leading up to it. They, they, they. They they say you know, her father is on record saying it doesn't matter what happened right. to Mora before she went missing. What matters is that she's missing. Let's find her. But that that just flies in the face of like everything that you do to find a missing person. And through uh, a, a legit source, James Renner was told by one of the friends of Mora at UMass. I only told the story to Fred, and and that's it. I'm not telling the story again. Yeah, that, that, why would why would you uh, why would you ever say that if 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 someone I don't know I mean if one of my friends told me that they're in a lot of like right. they're you know they they're in a lot of trouble they they've got a lot of stuff building up they just need to get away. I mean I would I would never even think to say that. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a fair point. The that's probably the most frustrating thing for me in this case is um, his idea that the past doesn't matter. It's actually, that's the exact opposite of the way that these cases are generally investigated. Every, you know, I spent so much time earlier talking about like the psychological autopsy piece. It's all about getting in the head of the person before they went away. So yeah, that is really frustrating. And I think you're, I think you're, you're probably right in that regard, that that seems more indicative of somebody who's trying to hide something as opposed to somebody, yeah, because if it was just, yeah, she's been really struggling lately, you know, is there, well, why can't we talk about that? Why can't we talk about the fact that she was stressed or that her bulimia had, had, had you know, come back or something, um, you know, kind of hypothetical like that? Unless there was an, an even an additional stressor that the family doesn't talk about, you know, so maybe, you know, maybe um, the hit and run, maybe the family did know that there was something going on with the hit and run, or maybe she got into to some additional trouble that the family was hiding. I think the the idea of her being overwhelmed and the you know some of the diagnostic stuff I talked about earlier, I think that can still fit the family's uh, aloofness or the family's um, I guess the family being kind of difficult afterwards because they might be covering up even something else on that list that we're not aware of that may have that she may have been struggling with. If we were to have the opportunity, let's say. Mora is found tomorrow. If we had the opportunity to have you ask her a couple of questions, let's say you had the opportunity to sit down with her for five minutes, what would be what would be the the most like paramount questions that you need resolved that you uh, would ask her? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think my questions would be that much different. I, then I think most people, I, I think if she was alive, the thing I would be most interested in was when she started the plan to get away. And, um, I'd love to know every step of that plan because if she, if she pulled this off, it's it, in my opinion, it's really impressive. I think it's a hard, you know, a lot of people have talked about, it. it's not that easy to disappear in um in the in the modern era you know the era that we live in i'd love to know when the kind of the seed started and the steps that she took to assure that she was able to get away for such a long period of time cuz it's now impressive. would that put it is impressive and would that put her into the uh into the category of being um a a sociopath or a psychopath you know, yeah i would still say no and i know i'm kind of being resistant on that because if somebody is conning and manipulative, but they're getting away 
maybe she's getting, maybe she did, was getting away from something that was dangerous, or maybe she was, you know, overwhelmed. You know, conning and manipulation is a pretty significant symptom of, of psychopathy, but it's still only one symptom, you know, so there's still a lot of things that would need to be present for her to, for her to be able to, for me to feel comfortable using that diagnosis. Right, because earlier on you said that it was something that you're kind of hardwired with, right? Yeah. So yeah. if she was getting away yeah. from something, it wasn't it wasn't because she was hardwired with this psychopathy. It was because she was reacting to to her environment. That that would be I I would think so. Although you know, like I said earlier, if she pulled this off, she definitely she you know I think there were some sneaky things that she did. You know, and I think you know James has been pretty clear about like what some of those things, you know, the, again, maybe taking the money from her dad or, or, you know, creating some diversions in terms of where she was going and those sorts of things. But, you know, if you look at just one trait, um, there are a lot of people who, you know, are pretty cunning and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're psychopaths. We got an email from a, another, uh, forensic psychologist oh, cool. And, uh, yeah, she, um, we, we may try to bring her on at some point. I'm not sure she's comfortable giving her name, so we won't at this point, but, um, she did ask about if there may have been some abuse in the family or some, uh, sexual abuse. Right. And she said that that could make some sense. And she also asked, um, about p- potentially Maura having been pregnant at the time. Right. A couple of things. Um, pretty interesting. And we, we've gotten emailed that before too, but not from a forensic psychologist. Right. Um, yeah. So what do you, what do you make of that? Yeah. I mean, we don't have any evidence of either of those things. So I, I, we should be careful around speculating The the, I gave you guys like the risk factors earlier of, you know, people that, um, you know, some of the risk factors for, for suicidality or, or self-harm. And I didn't mention it because there wasn't evidence of it in this case. That's like, that's that, you know, we, that we know about, but, um, yeah, a sexual abuse history is actually higher than anything on that list. Mm. So, you know, what I talked about earlier in terms of people who would be self-medicating, um, you know, people who might be prone to hypomanic episodes, people who'd be self-medicating, um, because of anxiety and stress and the, the, another big correlate there is a history of sexual abuse. I got a, uh, a question about psychopathy in general. Mm-hmm. So we know that, uh, psych- psychopaths, some of them can function greatly in society and yep. some of them are politicians, heads of companies, right. uh, law yep. enforcement, lawyers, things like that. Is it possible that Having no empathy and maybe in some of these other characteristics, is it possible that it's an advantage in the business world? And and I know this is maybe out of the blue a little bit, but is it possible that psychopathy is some form of human evolution? I, I couldn't answer the second question for you. Um, I guess the field's knowledge, the people who the, like mostly like uh, forensic neuropsychologists are, are finding increased evidence that there's a, a physiological component to it. So if you think about, you know, <laughs> like our brain evolving, there might be there might be some type of a connection there. But I, I've never there might be some really good articles on psychopathy and psychoevolutionary theory. But I've never I've never read any of them. There's a whole if if you're interested in checking this stuff out, there is a whole field of psychology called psychoevolutionary theory, and it looks at um, it basically applies what we know about evolution and Darwinian you know how we acquire our um, you know, our physical characteristics through the evolutionary process. We also, um, there are a lot of emotional traits that we tend to have and behavioral traits that can be tied to the evolutionary process. So you might, I mean, it's really fascinating. You know, you might, you, you can, I, I would definitely recommend looking into that if it interests you. The, um, the first question, you're, you're absolutely right about that. There are people um, I always sort of, I don't know if this is a proper term for them. When I teach about this in my class, I just always refer to them as non-criminal psychopaths. These are psychopaths that would be a little bit harder to pick up on the PCLR because the PCLR was designed to specifically measure psychopaths that were in correctional settings. But, you know, the idea of being um, manipulative, lacking empathy, um, being superficially charming when necessary, those traits can go a really long way in terms of, yeah, people being successful in the business world or being successful as politicians. Um, I think any job where you have the power to kind of exert like power and control over other people, which to be, I know I'm a professor, so even professors, you know, people who 
um, maybe enjoy being looked up to or have a grandiose self, a, a sense of self-worth. There, there are absolutely people who have those traits that don't have the desire to commit crimes, that don't have the desire to kind of be overtly, you know, harmful or predatory towards other people. So they, it's unlikely that they're going to commit, you know, violent criminal acts, but they do have much of the same, many of the same traits. But if they were pushed to it in some way, if, if they right. felt there was no other way out of it, a person like right. that would be more likely to uh, uh, commit murder or something like that? Yeah, uh, they, yeah. Um, I, I think a really good psychopath is probably going to put themselves in a position where they, they won't have to, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, um, yeah, they're, they're not the, the, the other thing that we see. And I mean, this is kind of, I think, insinuated by most of the other symptoms that we've talked about, but there's a lack of conscience, you know, that, that little voice that tells you like, you shouldn't do that. Um, psychopaths don't tend to have that little voice. So if push comes to shove, they're not going to, they're, they're going to be less likely to think twice about hurting somebody or doing what it takes to get what they want than, you know, you or, you or I. Last question I got here in my little booklet um, is I, I read a little bit recently about patterns of speech giving away psychopaths. Yeah, and, good. You guys are on it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit more about that? And could you tell us if we were to have Mora on the show, would we be able to tell um, just by listening to her talk? Um, pr probably not. I, I think, you know, in a small little, um, in a small window like that, I think it would be difficult to see. The research I've seen around this stuff, again, is done with people that are in prison. So these are people that are pretty high on psychopathy. So they, they might be like uh, more overt cases. But I, I was going to bring this up, and you guys kind of brought this up recently. And I want to make it very clear, I'm also, you know, not, I'm not diagnosing Fred as a psychopath because <laughs> we haven't even really talked about Fred too much. But there's some, there is some really interesting literature on psychopaths being overly wordy when they talk, having kind of a stylistic thinking style, what's sometimes referred to as an impressionistic um, writing, uh, a talking style. I remember reading this article when I was in graduate school that fascinated me that I revisited recently. Psychopaths are more likely to use like metaphors and cliches when they talk. Because it's a way of making it like sound like they're talking about something that's important, but it's really a lot of fluff. So, with that being said, the last episode that we had where we uh, we read Fred's letters, do you see any of that kind of stylistic? Um, you know, because it struck me as being very wordy uh, and very um, um, like sometimes poetic, and then it was very uh, very human and, and more emotional. Did you see any of that when you were listening to the podcast with those two letters? Yeah, I mean, it's a very small sample. You never want to read anything into, or you don't want to read too much into one piece of evidence. Um, and just like everything else we talked about with with Mora, even if that is present, it doesn't mean that, that Fred is a psychopath. But th that was absolutely what struck me about those letters. Again, really stylistic, really impressionistic. Kind of, um, at times, like, it sounds like he's saying a lot, but it's mostly, like, there's a lot of fluff to what he's saying. Well, what's interesting too is you guys brought up some overt deception. The other thing that I could be wrong about this, but he he talked about the weather being 12 degrees on the night that Moore disappeared. And the things that I read, um, I thought it was like a little bit like unnatural, like uncharacteristically warm in, in New England that night, but I'm, I'm not certain about that. So there's there are a couple of potential pieces of, inter of, of overt deception. And then that overly stylistic, impressionistic approach to writing that he had. Um, there's something more subtly deceptive when you're when you're writing with that type of a flourish. Um, I will say this though. Uh, I think an alternative explanation for that, and I, I want I don't want to sound insensitive when I say this, and I hope this doesn't come out the wrong way. But the other place where you sometimes see that style of writing is somebody who, and I get the sense that Fred is pretty bright but somebody who is bright but maybe not as formally educated, when somebody with a little bit less of an educational background directs a letter to people who are in positions of authority, it's not uncommon for them to overdo it a little bit in an attempt to maybe sound a little bit more intelligent or because maybe they're a little bit self-conscious about, you know, even if it's, um, you know, a little bit more unconscious. So some of the flourish in Fred's writing might have been not necessarily an attempt to deceive, but it could have been an attempt to impress 
that's a possibility. But everything that you mentioned that you noticed about those letters, they all that stuck out to me as well. Something that's confused me about the family's behavior is that they don't accept help from anybody in this community who is actually trying to find his daughter. He seems, yeah. you know, in interviews, he seems very uh, genuine about um, missing his daughter. Uh, right. But And there's this whole community that wants to find his daughter, yeah. and he doesn't do any interviews, and he doesn't talk to these people, but he'll talk to um, Chronicle and, and the disappeared uh producers and he'll talk to Boston Magazine and we've had James say that he only talks to them when you know it's under his conditions and right. and there's a there's a list of things that they can ask him what is the what's the psychology there if yeah. you if you don't mind me asking to keep on James's theory of this that that does fit James's theory right this is a guy who's putting on a little bit of a show he wants to be in control he knows more than he's letting on to so he's that that's definitely a possibility you know if 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 James's theory is correct, I, that makes perfect sense. Um, I, you know, there is something interesting though, and th th I was thinking about ways that psychology could maybe inform this a little bit, and I've been thinking about it in these very, very specific ways, like psychological autopsies and psychopathy and diagnoses. But I was also, you know, thinking there's something in psychology called the availability heuristic or the availability bias, and what that states is we only have access. We, don't, we tend to use information that we have available to us or things that are the most obvious examples of things. So I, I do want to present a little bit of a counter to some of the things that James has said about this. The first would be, and I, I like the way that James phrases this, and he might be right about this, but when he says um, this is not a family who's looking for their, their daughter, he's never seen a family who has a missing child who they don't seem to want help. That's not, unfortunately, that's not true. You know, if you go to like the Charlie Project website or if you go to the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, this country is full of people who run away whose families don't really care that much. You know, all over Facebook are these really heartbreaking web pages of we're looking for our son and the web pages haven't been updated for four or five years. So I think James sees these people who are doing all the right things and assumes that's the norm because that's those are the examples that are available to us when the reality is there are a lot of people who don't do what we would think they should be doing when their when their child goes missing um, and I think this is such an interesting case because we're we know so much about it and the public is so invested in this case that um, we're aware of a family who seems a little bit aloof or a little bit disinterested, but that's actually not that uncommon. Um, and th but we don't think of those examples because we don't see those examples because they're not out there, you know, kind of fighting for their children. The other thing that I think is so interesting, you guys can maybe speak to this a little bit. You guys were from New England. I grew up in New York and then I lived in Baltimore and then I moved to New England. And I am, I'm only now getting used to how and this is going to sound like a stereotype and there are so many exceptions to this rule but i am i'm still sort of blown away by how guarded new englanders are in terms of just like the cultural norm in new england of um stay out of my business it's not any of your business this has happened in our family leave us be the sort of the libertarian streak of i'll mind my business i'll mind my business if you mind yours um and very, like, anti-authoritarian. Do you guys agree? I mean, I, I think I've noticed that more because I'm not from New England. So when I got here, it was sort of jarring. Does that make sense to you guys? It, abs it, it completely makes sense. And all you have to do is look at the uh, state motto on the New Hampshire license right. plate. And what's that? State Fred motto, from, live free or die. Yeah. So I know Fred is from Massachusetts. But that libertarian streak is in my, I mean, I think it's common everywhere in New England, but especially like like working class blue collar families that have been in New England for a long time. You know, um, I, I, I don't know if that's a perfect explanation. And the things that James brings up that are fishy, they're fishy. Like I don't want to disc you know, discredit that. But I, I also think that if you're coming at this from a little bit more of like um, where I grew up in New York or maybe a little bit more of a Midwestern perspective, their behavior looks really bizarre. But I think it's it's not that far afoot from the way that many New Englanders, I think, view authority and view outsiders looking into their um, 
you know, looking into their lives. So I think that might be a little bit of an explanation for, I think, what we label as really kind of strange behavior. You know, I, I was, like I said, I was a therapist for a while. When I was a graduate student, I did a lot of therapy. And then when I, I moved to New Hampshire, I worked at the, the college counseling center here. And, you know, I, I love being a therapist and I've always really prided myself on building rapport with my clients. As a clinician working in New England compared to other places I've worked, it was sometimes harder getting people to open up and um, share things that were a little bit more private, even in the therapy room. Um, I think it's just a guarded culture uh, up here. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. It is a much it is a, a much more guarded culture. You you mentioned the um, kind of the lack of uh, lack of trust, lack of confidence in um, law enforcement and authority. I I just I still have a hard time, you know, thinking that somebody couldn't get over that when their daughter's missing. I agree. I I, I think it's an interesting explanation, and it might explain some things. Um, but I think even with all of that um, being considered, I, th- I still think there's some unusual behavior from the family here. Right. And, and I've, I've said this before. So even if you take that attitude to, um, you know, to, to the authority right. figure and, and you, you're, you, know, you don't have the trust or the confidence in them, you still have this entire community of people that wants to help, that is acting right. in that way where it's like, okay, well, you know, yeah. Yeah. get out, you know, anti-authority, we're here for you, we're going to help you. And, and so you've alienated both sides now. That's a great point. Yeah, no, I think I, I totally agree. Yeah. I want to, the one last thing that I, I just want to say, I think I've probably made this clear, but I do have that theory that I've got, I guess, like one foot in a little bit more. I'll say though, I, I actually hope that I'm wrong. Um, as a, as somebody who does like true crime and kind of likes these cases, I think the idea of somebody running away and starting a new life is is more interesting and more fascinating and most importantly we're talking about a real person here so um i I hope she's alive and doing well somewhere and and maybe a little bit happier in the life that she has now than in the life that she left behind so um this is definitely a case where i've got my theory a little bit but i like everybody else who speculates on this case i can definitely be wrong and uh this is an example where i i hope i am wrong well put yeah, yeah I think, absolutely. Yeah, I think we all so, feel that way. Yeah, uh, yeah. We hope she's doing okay. So you have your uh, you have your theory, and um, your theory is that uh, she went into the woods and, and chose a place where she could uh, um, die by herself. Correct. Yeah, I, and either because she was suicidal or because it was like one last attempt to get away, and the nature got the best of her. Does it? Does it? Does the rag in the tailpipe frustrate you? Does that throw in some sort of? Uh... That is every time. Worst. Every time. Every time I've thought about like, okay, yeah. she's she's she went into the woods and and she wanted to die alone in an area yeah. that she really loved, and I just keep coming back to the rag in the tailpipe, and that just spins my head around and around, and it, you know, I get I, I just get caught up in uh, everything that led up to this rag in the tailpipe. Yeah, I I wish I had an answer for that, guys. Like I, for me, the rag in the tailpipe is such a, a fascinating clue. It's, it's it's to me it's bizarre, and it it I think it get just it uh it gets in the way a lot of a lot of ideas with this case. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Robert Eckstein, for coming on the show and talking to us a little bit about psychopathy and the headspace that Maura Mari was in. Um, It's been a really, hopefully, an eye-opening episode for the audience, and I know it has been for me and Lance. I got to say, the best part of this, uh, first of all, thank you for coming on. Thank you for listening, and um, uh, what you've uh, provided for the information has been extremely, extremely enlightening to me. Um, I I, I love the fact that uh, we have such an interactive audience where we can say something on one podcast, and someone like yourself will recognize it as not completely accurate. And, and know that, hey, I got to fix this. I got to figure out how to fix this. So um, I like that behavior and I like, the, uh, I like the interactiveness and I like that you're actually bringing something to the table and not just using what your personal theory is about it to, to forward your way of thinking. I really like talking to you guys. It was a lot of fun and really interesting.